Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. This is Ankit and I have been working with ThoughtWorks for past three years. And yeah, in general, six years of in industry experience. During this course, I have been working um, technologies across front end, back end, database, or you can say uh, cloud. And yeah, my forte relies with front end and that's where uh, this session. So we have worked quite a lot across streams where uh, design is implemented. You can say where we need micro front end or whether we need micro front end and then tell if the need of libraries or design systems in between. So yeah, we'll drive through that in this session. Over to you, Visha. Uh, thanks, Mpu. So as for me, uh, I've been in IT industry for the last eight and a half years now, uh, mostly uh, uh, working in uh, front-end domains only. So I have, have explored different frameworks, but, but React is kind of my forte right now. Uh, uh, from the last few years, I think I moved uh, into mobile space also. So working on hybrid, like working on creating cross-platform apps in React Native and all. And that is where the whole idea of creating the whole, creating a component libraries and working on design systems have come into picture for us within a micro front end of course. So that, that's all we are gonna talk about in this session today. Uh, over to you Ankit to start with. Yeah, thanks Vishal. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, we can see. Yeah, and you can see the slides, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, so in this uh, March edition, we'll talk about design systems and I'll walk you down through the agenda. Yeah, for the next uh, one hour, we'll talk about what are the basic W's for design systems, like what, why, how, and some of the building blocks in the design systems, a glimpse of style guides, then uh, going through the component libraries, coming to popular design systems in the market. We'll also go through one exercise for component bifurcation, followed by atomic design basics. And then uh, Vishal will walk us through a demo for atomic design with storybook. And we'll end our note with design guilds and the pitfalls that we should avoid in design systems. For the audience, uh, does it seem like what they were hoping from for the session? Maybe you can give your reactions or anything in chat. All right. Sure, let's start it then. So start with a quote. So styles, they actually come and go, but a good design, it's a language and it's really not a style. So it, it has come from physical world rather than us being virtual. So Massimo believes uh, that in reality, when we talk about, uh, you, you can say the real life design, we have to adapt to it and it's a breakthrough. And that's how the software industry is also adapting it. Yeah. Coming down to what is a design system? So a design system is essentially an ecosystem where you define some tools, guidelines, some principles, and it helps your team to ship the product more effectively and more efficiently. Basically, we are trying to achieve consistency across our design. It may happen that most of the times that we are in our sync with our designers. However, at the development time, it goes haywire. We don't end up in the same uh, gestures or maybe some padding margin. They are not up to the right. And the final product we do have to honor all these things, especially in case the client are so relying on their brand image. Let's say you mess up with a color that can cost a huge to the company. So yeah, that, that's how the design system makes a place as, it's, uh, as we will talk about in the next slide as well. Coming down to why design systems are used. So the design systems, they actually enable the product oriented teams to obtain consistent design results. First of all, it helps you to synchronize all the call your designers, your product teams on, and they bring it onto the same page. It helps you to reduce any communication issues and you build a shared vocabulary or a design language, which with you can communicate. Yeah. 
then you have one solution for one component. Basically, the component comes with the idea where you ship your design with that component. So across your product, one component can serve the same need. You can say consistent sliders, consistent buttons, and so on. Then we can also talk about that there could be easier testing if we have done it at a component level. There is no re repetition of testing that you have to do at various levels. We talk about unit test or integration test. Once a component is developed, you can uh, unit test it and then test its integration at the places where you use it. Then we can achieve faster rotations once the design patterns are established. Essentially in the backend as well, the design patterns have helped a lot. But in UI, if you achieve this consistency, it will help you again, uh, speed up in, in your iterations. And that's where agile teams look up to. And finally, you get a future proof base for your extensions and any refinements that we look forward to. If you have a component to look for, but it, it, you can say it, it has version up, it's up to your team to consume it or not. You can still use the uh, a previous version until it becomes deprecated, and then you can move on to the newest version when you have the bandwidth. Any questions so far? Any thoughts, comments? Are people able to get the session? Yeah, I can see a few likes. People, please free, free, uh, feel free to ask your questions and in case you want to add as well, it's open. All right, yep, I can see in chat. Thank you. Moving on, now we'll talk about some of the building blocks that we can establish while creating the design system. The first building block for us is the style guide. What is style guide? So essentially it's a collection of some predefined rules which designer and developers agreed to follow so that they can ensure consistency in their brand products. It can be across app, website, and especially print. We cannot forget the print is the original one and it will stay uh, until the end of this universe. So the style guides, it consists of various things that we'll talk about. First is color palette, followed by typography, grid systems and spacing, icons and imagery, and the tone of voice. So we'll go through these individually. So if you think the overall style guide, every component in it or every bit plays its role. If you even miss a single one, the product image might be hampered or in general, the whole design system get can hampered for your product. So that's why we, uh, we'll see the importance of color palette, typography, grids, icons, and the tone of voice. Anything unfamiliar or not familiar in this slide for anyone? Okay. I hope people are getting yes. So we'll talk about color palette now. What is color palette? Yeah, in the color schemes, which will depict your brand image, a complementing color palette, it can of, of course gauge more customers to your product. Ever think what is the most common color in most of the products that they are using? Just imagine any product that uh, you see in the app, maybe any app website, what's the most common color that you see? Yeah, I can I can see white, blue, red, white. Yeah, can people name the product as well? Any app where you where you see white? Maybe in their branding. Yeah, there we go. Thanks to ProBoDH. Yeah, uh, FP. FP has the blue color, and that specific blue is also copied to other websites. Yeah, Zomato uses red and white. Yeah. Apple all together. So uh, we will talk about Apple design system. It's uh, you can say a completely different thing and uh, no, especially no one can beat them at the, at the stage that where, where they are. Yeah. So uh, if we see the blue that we've talked about in the Facebook, it's also co common to Twitter and several other brands. Does anyone know why blue color is so prominent in most of the world famous products? 
if anyone would like to take a guess why blue color is so being used yeah neutral color uh, stress free I, I am not sure <laughs> uv light is blue so not not sure yeah Th thanks ram so blue resonates with trust so it's in our psychology we, if you see a blue color we can say we can trust this person we can trust this idea we can trust this product and that's how uh, that started building on top of many other uh, companies yeah so you have to speak about your brand so that's why coca cola's red why they have uh, opted to a specific color tone there is a reason for it yeah so we now we'll see what all branding colors various systems have defined and why we want to rely on to a particular type of color palette so in every color palette we have some primary some secondary and a bit of neutral colors so it's a mix of these three let's take example of ibm's carbon color palette it starts with a shade of blues then we have a couple of secondary colors which you can choose from a shade of grays black and white and finally some alert colors these are specifically came into play once we got this kind of first status whether what's the progress of task in most of the apps these colors are being used for uh, depicting any status then we got the most popular uh, color palette which is google's material design they are also following a kind of like primary secondary and then a bifurcation to a neutral and finally some kind of error uh, depicting colors almost all color patterns they they have a set of consistency and there is a reason why they have chosen a particular hash code to be in part of their uh, design or you can say their color palette the, a lot of user testing and the user research has went into it and all the colors you might find more soothing and appealing to uh, to eyes and psychological effect as well yeah any questions on color color palette Uh, take that as no then uh, people please do ask your questions if you uh, don't want to speak then you can also ask in chat but i would recommend to also uh, verbally speak that might help as well for everyone yeah so i can answer this question right away so how to choose a color palette for your design so essentially check with your designers if you have a design team that they can uh, find a target group for testing and on the niche target group you can take your win that what is your market let's say if you are targeting indian market you would have get different results if you are target targeting german market you will get different results same what is your age group target whether you are tar targeting 20 to 40 40 to 60 or you are tar targeting kids you will get different uh, color recommendations from your designers so uh, a, a bit of user research and uh, perhaps user testing can help you here but if you want to take a off shelf product even then you you can consult your designers that what their recommendation is that uh, which color palette suits you better if you want to start on an app then you might want to rely on apple's uh, core design system what they already have or android's core design system what they already have hope that answers uh, answers your question uh, raksha all right Just to add to it, I think most of the organizations also have their color palette. So, like they already have that set of guidelines that for any application they need to follow. So, then that is how the the designers uses that color palette to build a new design for the new application. Yeah. Thanks, Vishal. So, more in most of the times when we have we have clients to uh, and they have their own branding already ready. Take example of any product; they have their brand guidelines. So, yeah, we have to comply to those. All right. Uh, moving on to the next one. Again, uh, an interactive uh, slide. So, a question to everyone: What what's the most catchy thing in this uh, snippet or let's say the this edition of uh, boston globe newspaper what's the most catchy thing for you 
yeah potatoes no one spare the potatoes yeah red line heading yep interesting yep all right people can be yeah, still uh, uh, put on chat we'll, we'll just say take a poll in the end maybe what what's the win so image speaks about thousand words yes that's true but the focus uh, for this slide specifically is the boston globe uh, i'll talk about why this font if you see this particular font has been very popular in uh, in american history first of all and that's a reason there is a reason for it so the way the letters arrange themselves and in case it's legibly clear and visually appealing to the user or let's say the reader it makes more impact and on our target group when this font was tested it came out to be most appealing although personally for me it was not so legible but yeah the testing group says that they find it more appealing so yes we are talking about typography here and typography did uh, does count quite a lot in case you choose a wrong uh, style let's say you use a comic style in your business app that doesn't make sense so if you want to choose between serif and sans serif first and then if you already have a font uh, like for color you have uh, things ready at your with your client if you already have for font as well go with that but if you want to choose then again the designer's pick can help you here that what's the most soothing font family would fit here for example uh, most of the times times new roman and calibre that's the font that we see in our uh, daily meals you can say or in uh, normal papers you can decide up to which font can get you more customers and it actually will make the difference yeah and any questions on typography why is it important all right moving on to the next slide then iconography so icons give the user an instant idea that what is the state of the system or what would happen next in your system take an example of this battery icon so if, if anyone want to highlight what, what this uh, does depict or maybe the difference between first and second yeah turbo charging yep yeah exactly yeah it it can be battery saving the second one how about the last two quite simple yeah battery full and this can be empty battery yeah so you see uh, uh, even to the words they are difficult to you can say uh, get the idea easily but you get this in a like milliseconds that what this uh, depicts same goes for bluetooth so one you can say it, it is connected or connecting and the second is that you have your bluetooth on and maybe another one with a dry shade where you where you say that the bluetooth is off yeah and this particular sign last one is anyone familiar with this seen it in quite yeah fingerprint yeah almost all the apps like depict this on on your screen when you do ha have to do a fingerprint aadhaar based apps or any other apps Yeah. So iconography yeah, again, icons are very crucial in any app, and with a small icon, you can uh, replace a statement or a, a full line of text, and just simple design of icon can help you there. Any questions, thoughts, or uh, comments on icon iconography? All right. coming on to the next one so the building blocks that we discussed so far are color palette then typography and iconography now we'll talk about how how and why grid systems take importance while creating the style guide so grids have been there for from ages so we yeah, 
even in uh, you can say roman times the importance of bread has been crucial so we will we'll see that uh, just in a, in a in a sec so if you see in our normal textbooks that, that we might have been reading from school they they follow the proper grid yeah next example maybe a bookshelf or uh, a shelf in gym anything that you can depict they, it still has the same like layout of a grid a city yeah this is barcelona but yeah this could be easily as chandigarh or any other planned city maybe lavasa that has a perfect grid system and then the real world tool excel how they thought about a perfect grid system maybe a photo imagery where you want to uh, put some photos and here i talked about maybe very earlier times as well the margins if you see a perfect grid system the importance that how a particular art is being made yeah even the oldest newspapers they have like kind of perfect uh, you can say grids placed there and so on so this link will be shared later you can again take a grab on it so by this article i just wanted to highlight that the grids are not new they they have been there for ages and in the real software world it still plays out your app your uh, web uh, you can say web applications if you have a symmetry that will have a great psychological effect and that's how uh, again a more customer audience or you can say more uh, audience you can gauge essentially so we'll talk about what the grid systems will consist of you have columns yeah then you have margins here the green and finally the alleys or you can say gutter space with the blue and you must check with your designers whenever they are creating the designs whether they are following this uh, most of the designers are already following this they might not be telling you but in essentially while you are developing you also need to take care of this grid size you need to define whether your minimum grid size is 4 pixel 8 pixel 16 pixel whatever uh, standards you are following that will help you achieve uh, maybe a pixel perfect design yeah any questions on uh, grid systems and spacing hope you got, you got it or maybe nothing <laughs> all right yeah uh coming on to the last one in this so tone of voice so uh, this one is actually more uh, you can say uh, this makes its place quite recently that we the design designers or ux persona they discovered it recently uh, by recent i mean maybe last 50 years by the way because other things exist quite from quite long time in in the physical world so tone of voice it actually refers to the actual copy the way you are saying the way your uh, app is being interpreted so tone of voice it can be professional it can be welcoming funny or a very mixed feelings and uh, if you see the emojis they are actually saying this tone of voice uh, these days quite a lot however you can still play out uh, with words to uh, deliver a quite beautiful tone of voice via your app or via your product only tuning that you need to make is how much playful you are or how much serious you are while delivering that tone of voice or uh, a fine tune between casual and formal same goes for cheeky and respectful and being a enthusiastic like uh, or displaying such a matter of fact this you can easily find on firefox design um, uh there from the, this reference has been taken now we'll see some real world examples where tone of voice uh, has made an impact and i hope you folks might be able to refer this
So uh, Dunzo is one of the apps that delivers tone of voice in actual words. And uh, personally, I find it very enthusiastic way and it actually get, gets them target conversion. Yeah. So I'm prompted to order from Dunzo with, by seeing these uh, notifications. And I think most of the users who let's like, say in need, they would definitely uh, try Dunzo one if they remember such interactive experience. Like let's say your salary has been credited. So wordplay, like salary or salary. Then same, dahi kilo ka hath maybe dahi. So that's the wordplay. So all these could be playful tones, bit of cheeky tones as well in somewhere, but most of them are playful. Or maybe deal to pagal hai. Yeah, they're just offering some deal. And the permanent broom mates, when you, if you want to order any like scrubber or uh, anything. Related, anyone uh, saw these before on any of the apps they want to mention? Yeah, Zomato. So I personally feel Zomato ones are very cheeky. So they are like insulting most of the times, like you have to order, you don't have a choice to order, like up to order Karlo, like sort of. And yeah, PTM also does that. Recently, IPL also did, did this, the IPL website, uh, the IPL app, they were also like uh, displaying these notifications. Yeah, 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 Vishap, you're right. Amul is also being in, in this from quite long time. Cool, yeah, same same for Swiggy. So most of the food ordering apps or like uh, uh, instant ordering, they are, they are using this. Yeah, um, moving on to what Ram has said before. Yes, so I again would like to highlight that point. So uh, in the B2B apps, in the business apps, being respectful is very important. Uh, so we do have to bear in mind that we are building our apps in uh, uh, for professional, uh, you can say, like, let's say, take an example of an internal app that, that we have for our users. Same, same you, you have to be a, a bit of cautious there. And still the notifications can adhere to very respectful tone of voice. Yeah. Yep. Moving on to the, um, this one. So now I'll take, give this to Vishal. So he'll talk about the journey from UX that we discuss to UI, how we'll implement it. Over to you, Vishal. Thanks, Ankit. Uh, can I share the screen now? Yeah. Thank you. So uh, as Ankit mentioned, like a lot of things that we have discussed from the UX, UX perspective, like we, we talked about colors, we talked about typography, tone of voice and all. These all things comes under the bucket of UX, like how to build those systems, how to build those mocks to follow these patterns. Now, once we have that ready from our UX designers, how to build that into our UI world, like, how to move from UX to UI, but because that's our responsibility as a developer, correct? So in the next set of slides, we will talk about what different patterns you can follow and we'll stick to one pattern and get deep or deeper into that. So in general, like I've seen that people following different things, uh, different patterns to actually build this UI now. So for example, your, your UX has given you a mock-up a screen and you need to implement that. And since we are into component uh, comp component uh, model now, uh, we try to actually build different components out of that. Uh, I have seen people building the whole full-fledged component into one component and then dividing into different components. Those components also have their business logic or functional logic also into it. Or if we don't want to go towards that, we can follow a particular design pattern. And one of those is atomic design pattern, where what you do is you actually divide your whole page or a whole screen or a whole list of components that you have, uh, that your designers have given you into different smaller units. So this, this analogy, this, this pattern has, has followed the analogy of chemistry, where it says that uh, our design should have design tokens or an atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages. Uh, design tokens, if I talk in terms of 
atoms, you can consider it as electrons, protons, neutrons, and such. So these are the kind of building block for atom and further. So we'll go through this into, into, in, in, in some details. Uh, so first thing we will discuss about what are your design tokens. Uh, as we had discussed that there is a color palette, there is typography, there are grids and all. So in, in the implementation world, that all comes into, and into your design tokens. So you define your palette, you define which font family uh, in this particular design system you want to follow and, and build a design token for that. You define your spaces, what is your grid space, what is your grid gutter space, and define it next someplace. That is where the whole design tokens comes into picture. There are actually multiple libraries. Uh, from, like, I, I think there are, there, there, there are places where you can actually fetch the whole design tokens from also so that instead of hard coding into your application, you can try to fetch it from, from the APIs also. So usually people follow that practice also, I've seen that. And this can vary, like for example, if you're building a one style design system or a design component library, changing your design tokens actually automatically changes your whole component library itself following these design tokens. We will see that in real world also in the end of this session, but that's the whole idea of building these tokens. So moving on, once you have your design tokens ready, uh, you can start building your atoms. Uh, atoms are nothing but as the name implies itself, is the smallest unit for you. Uh, electrons, protons have their own identity, but as, as, a, as a living identity or a non-living entity, I think atoms is what we mostly talked about. So what can be a smallest building block for any, any, any design system? It can be your buttons, it can be your icons, your switches, your text input field uh, is, is, is another example. Your labels can be also your atoms, like smallest unit which you need to build is an atom. Once you build, your, build those atoms, you can actually build molecules. Now molecules, again, from the chemistry is nothing but a group of atoms. For example, if you see this example of a search box, uh, this icon itself is an atom. The search box, search icon is an atom. This hamburger icon is an atom. This input box, if you see this around, is, is an atom. But all together is a molecule. So you build a molecule using different atoms. And when you are building your functionality, you can just say, okay, render this molecule from my design component library. Similarly, uh, like search boxes are there, your progress bars are there, your steppers are here. For example, this can, it can or cannot be a, an atom, but it, these things together is a molecule. So you can directly say, oh, render my stepper from my component library. These are the things this, this stepper needs to work and pass this to part those things to this component and it will start working for you. So this, this becomes a group of atoms becomes your molecules. And if you move forward, a group of molecules joined together becomes an organism. Again, from chemistry, a human being is a group, like is a group of molecules, correct? You become, that becomes an organism. Uh, a very simple example, again, is a header. Uh, where you have a search, you have a title, you have a menu, menu in itself can be a different organism and this list also. Tables and charts, grids and lists becomes your organisms. Uh, in my particular opinion, uh, organisms are somewhere where your business logic comes into all picture also. So for example, you have buttons, uh, you have text inputs. Buttons and text inputs in, in uh, in, in, in a single grid uh, uh, or, or, a, or a block, or you can say click off that button will put something into that text, text input. So text input buttons can, is, are the molecules. In an organism which consists of these atoms and molecules, you can run your functionality which says clicking on button put something in your, uh, something in your input box or make an API call. So usually what I've seen that organisms do contain your functional logic, but atoms and molecules I feel are our smallest unit, which does not need to have any business or functional uh, code this for you, uh, code this for your app. So once you build these three system, I think uh, uh, 
then templates pages comes into picture where you just combine all the organisms to build a template and with the real content with the whole designs with vd coming into picture also for the template that is where you build your pages uh, in, in any component library or a design system when we talk about i think till till molecules matters a lot uh, but but organisms also comes handy there but usually what i seen that templates and pages uh, are not a part of your design component like very usually. So that is what you follow in, 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 in building a design component library, following a design system by your UX uh, uh, and dividing the whole system into multiple smaller units and clubbing them together to make a bigger entity. Now, like getting this knowledge, what we'll do is uh, we'll try to identify a few of the common atoms, molecules in, in most common websites, which is again, a Facebook page. So what do you think, like looking at this particular page, uh, like if you are the UI person, your UX folks has given you this page to build, uh, what can be different atoms you can actually uh, identify from this page? Buttons. Yeah. Do I see a button? Yeah, a save button can be a good example. Feed layout. Uh, all the items in the top icons, of course. Suggested group templates. Where is that? I can easily say an avatar can also be an icon. Right? Uh, this icon or this this number of friends can be an item itself. Icons, as you mentioned, can be icons. Text styles, of course, labels, your headings, uh, your H1 to H6 are items. Uh, yeah, what, what are the different molecules you can identify here? A header can be a molecule. I would say header can be an organism also. Yeah. The navigation bar can be. Yeah. A search bar. That, that's a brilliant answer. A search bar definitely is a molecule. Icon plus level. Yes, definitely a, uh, a molecule. A sidebar. Sidebar, I, I would say, I'll still say uh, that's an organism because a list can be a molecule, a list item can be a component, but sidebar in itself, I will say it's an organism. Similarly, if I move on to organisms, uh, uh, I think Rafi told that uh, feed is a is an atom. I would say a feed that you see here or, or inside this is, is an organism. Because if, if, if you split it into multiple atoms, you can clearly say this has an avatar. Uh, this has a label, which is what's the username or where does it live? These labels, an image, uh, the address of where that person has checked in. So club together, that can be a molecule also, but that can, uh, for me, it, it seems more as an organism. A side menu, of course, is, is an organism. A header, the full-fledged header is an organism that consists of search bar as a molecule, this icon as an atom, and these things as a molecule and an atom. Cool. Uh, nobody talked about this chat box. What can be a chat box? Uh, an atom or a molecule, an organism, can be mix of everything because there are atoms. So when you say mix, it becomes an organism. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a it's a group of atoms, molecules. It, it in itself, it's it's a big it's a full fledged feature. Some people can say this is a page itself if it opens up uh, to the full screen. Individual chat can be a molecule. I will say individual chat, if it consists of just the chat message, that can be an atom because it's just a, just a, I will say paragraph tag you are entering and you define your paragraph, how, how that should look like. 
Now, if that has your avatar icon and you want to club it together as one component, then yes, it's a molecule. Cool. Uh, I think we got a good good set of answers. Uh, this is what we tried to split. If you see, these are the different building blocks for the whole Facebook homepage. The sidebar, the header, the feed, uh, what you're in mind, and, and, and your right-hand side feed also, and chat, of course. So I would say next time, whenever you start building any page, any screen, even if you are not building a styled component library, uh, try to split the whole thing into multiple smaller units. It's become very, very easy to build the whole system. And you can clearly see a segregation of responsibility. We talked about, like we talk about single responsibility principles in 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 day to day basis. That also implies in your in your design systems also. My single button. If you build a single button as an atom, that is a single responsibility. You are following that a button will click. A button will have some some text inside it. A button will have some background color. So you build only that much of functionality and and whosoever consumes that button, let's say uh, uh, an organism, you build an organism just for a functionality that suits that organism only and pass the respective callbacks to those buttons if I talk in JavaScript terms. So try to achieve, try to use that, try to implement it in your in, in your day-to-day basis. Any any questions till now? Um, well, I hope I was clear or all clear. Good. So what we will do is uh, we will actually have a very small example of building the whole thing. Uh, now we know that what can be the building blocks of a this component library. There are different packages or different libraries available in the market, which helps us to build those components library also. So for example, if you don't use any component library system, you have to build such, such components in your functional, using your functional stories itself, correct? You can't render it without that. But these libraries help you to render just the just the building blocks, just these atoms, molecules, widgets itself, instead of relying on your functional stories to build this. So that is where all these kind of component libraries comes into picture, which will have, which, which will give you a view of your source code, your documentation, of course, when you are writing a component, you will directly say, okay, which props do you, do you, this component need to make it work? So that becomes your component for your, that becomes your documentation for your component library. And what are the different flavors your component renders into? We will see that in the live example also. So these are the three examples. I think most of us, I hope, are already aware of Storybook, but there is factorlab.io, factor, fractal.build also available in the market. Storybook, I see it's the most common uh, tool used in the multiple projects also. So what we will do is uh, we have a very small demo of, of building the whole things that we have just talked about in in the storybook uh, as an example. So yeah, I'll, I'll just move to that part now. So if you see here, uh, this is storybook running local uh, to, to in, in my local host, uh, which have multiple atoms. Uh, very, very basic items. We have built a typography system, which will have headings, paragraphs, labels, and help text in, in different variations. Uh, now, the, the, this becomes your uh, building blocks. This, this is what you get under your typography. And following the same typography that you have got from your designers, you build, build the components out of it. So you can directly say render H1. We'll see the code also for this. Similarly, text input, I talked about that, like a simple text input is your atom. So a text input, plain text input, a text input with, with a success state, with an error state and a disabled one. This all works with different props and buttons, of course. We all talk like fancy buttons with the different sizes, uh, with disabled states also. 
and like you have primary buttons you have secondary buttons also and similarly if you have more variations of those buttons you can definitely create those also like tertiary buttons without any any border and so on like you can build multiple uh, different atoms uh, as we talked about icons uh, and, and 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 more now these are the very basics example of atom similarly a molecule i feel a form control I'm, I'm just using the analogy from the bootstrap here. A form control becomes your an atom, or becomes your molecule, who is actually consuming different atoms here. A label, we build a table in the typography. I'm just consuming this to be, build a molecule. A text input, we just saw that. And a help text. Help text also we build as part of our typography. And similarly, if you form control, it is, 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 is in your error state or, or success state, Instead of building a whole, the whole functionality again, you already have that functionality available in your atom. You can directly render that. So this becomes a very, very simple, very, very basic example of, of a design component library following atomic design pattern in Storybook. Uh, from the implementation side also, what if you see here, uh, we have building block, we have design system typography, uh, here we have colors here and using those smaller units, I will say these are tokens, we build a whole theme and we are building a different set of atoms and molecules. Atoms consist of buttons, text input, typography. And if you see the implementation right now, we are using React. Uh, it's a React with styled components. Um, it's very easy to write style component if you have already used it, and I think most of us will be aware of that. Uh, yeah, so if you see typography, we just build this typography components, which is saying that build a, a, a H1 is a component for me and return me a H1 from my style component, which is nothing but a H1 from my HTML tag, which has these styles. And from where are, am I getting these styles? From the theme. So I we defined a theme here. We are just consuming those theme.typography.h1.font family. If you see the typography here, it has all things defined in the theme. Right now, font family is Roboto Regular. So you will see that Roboto Regular is being rendered over there. Similarly, like we can go into details of each component, uh, but for the time being, I'll just say text input is nothing but an input box where you have multiple variations of those. What happens if my prop is a success? So this, this magic is via styled component library, uh, uh, which is based out based on top of React. They're just saying, okay, build this styled component using these props. And these props, you can just pass to this style this uh, atom as a component and your styled component will build, will build it following these styles. Now, and similar to buttons, like if you see the implementation, it's just a button, but if you see the styles, it all, render, it all renders from the variations, different variations of the button that you have defined in your theme. Now, these, these are atoms. Like if I talk about molecule here, and if you see the implementation, molecule again is nothing but rendering of atoms. Styled label. Uh, if you see here, and I'm, I'm just rendering a label, which is coming from an atom. I'll, uh, an input box, this text, text input we just saw in atoms. Help text, help text. We already have defined that in our atoms. But if you if you are building a big huge form, correct? You can directly say, okay, build a form control, render a form control with all these props. So your actual form business logic need not to worry about these types because your design component library is taking care of those things. You just need to make sure that you are passing the correct props at correct state. Like if your form is in an added state, you just need to pass an added true to it and your design component library will take care of that. Again, segregation of concerns. This is concerned about styles. Your actual functionality is concerned about the business logic. Cool. Uh, 
yeah a few more things that on 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 this is like we have using uh, a typescript also uh, for example a theme a theme the whole theme is based upon an interface a typescript interface so if you want to build a new theme like if you want this particular component library to follow a new theme you have to make sure that it follows this contract if you don't follow this or contract your style component library or or your component library will not find for example let's say if i remove colors my theme is giving me an error that colors is is an is a necessary uh, property that you need to for pass it to it and even at the lowest level also for example typography we are saying that my typography is defined as this and each block is a i text rule which has to has these properties right i'm just saying it's a, it's it's a string for for the easiness but you can build you you can use more typescript with uh, uh, things or on top of this so this way you are making sure your whole library whosoever wants to consume it with a new theme follows the right contract otherwise it will not work to give you an example of this uh, like right now if you see the button it sits into blue theme but let's say i as a consumer i want to use the same component library following a red theme so if i am not passing the right grid size it will start giving me this it's it's not correct you have to pass it similarly typography uh, if i don't pass it i'm saying that my i theme is following this typography so you have to follow this so give, giving it change of theme here if i just say instead of using the default theme use my red theme it will automatically changes the whole component locally your borders change your colors change right now i'm just changing the button styles but you can you can extend the whole thing uh, using the same way and yeah two more things uh, on the on top of this again since the whole component library is for styling you can actually test your component library also for example a button i can write very specific style text also on top of it i can say that if i am rendering a button in a disabled mode i expect the background color to be this i expect the border color to be this similarly a secondary default button i expect this to behave like this a molecule test a molecule can easily say that it should match the this is a snapshot test but in in general it says that okay if you are saying that i am rendering a form control in a success variation it the the help text should have a color of this so now your design component library is taking care of your styles uh, test and if you render these component library in your actual uh, code or in your actual functional storage you can write very specific functional text itself instead of writing the style text there uh, your your concerns are segregated there and last but not least uh, uh, in general what you see is like once you have built this whole component library uh, it's it's very important to deploy it also uh, like consider it as a node module consider it as a functionality itself so once you are creating a new component into it or you are making more variations into it or you are adding uh more necessary changes into an already defined component write proper test make sure you push it make sure your build pipelines are running which are actually running your unit tests out of this and once that part is complete and everything is working the way we expect it to deploy it so that like not only developers running this style component library into in the local machines any pos any business person can actually hit that Uh, hit that url and see that these are the different uh, components available in my component library maybe next time a uh, same organization same enterprise wants to build a new uh, application and they want to see that what are uh, items what what different components are already available they can just directly go to that link and see that what are all the things are available to me already so make sure you are actually deploying this also it helps a lot
um, and and wherever you want to consume it. For example, you are building this component. How to consume it in your actual application? You can you can simply build an odd module out of it. Uh, if you see the package JSON here, we are just saying build it. Build once you are built, you just deploy it and serve it via any any uh, mechanism. Once it is served, it is available. Once build, build it as a node module and consume it in your packages and in your actual application. Yeah, a lot of things I have discussed here. Any questions? I hope it it all all is making sense. Can I move forward? Hello, am I audible? Mm, yes. Yeah, hi Vishal. Uh, this is a very good uh, atomic design system that you have explained us. I wanted to know more about the template. Like yeah. how should we decide the entire layout of the page? How should we decide how we have to place uh, the different, different uh, what you call as uh, organisms on a page? So place, when you say, where do you place, that means? I mean, where, whenever we are creating a template, we are putting the different molecules or the organisms on, like we have the sidebar at the left, we have the feed in the center, mm -hmm. the search right. box at the top. So how should we think on to decide uh, where should be placing all these elements on the page? It's, it's a good question. I'll give you an example here. Yeah. Uh, for example, let me just write some pseudo code here. Okay. So let's say you are building a Facebook homepage. Okay. This is my uh, organism. So we talked about buttons, which which has styles just for buttons. Text inputs. Molecules have styles for molecule. For example, molecules should also have styles, which says. Okay, how much this help text and this input box uh, have space in between? For example, if you're using a grid system of eight pixel, this molecule has to have, have, have to define this, that there is an eight pixel difference between these two things. Okay, in the implementation also, you can see that there is a margin top of grid size eight pixel. So following the same pattern, if you see here, once you are building an atom, which consists of different molecules and atoms, your organism should be responsible for defining the whole template here. So if I am building this, this particular block, okay, what happens within that block is a, is a responsibility of this organism. How much space that avatar should have from the left, from the top, how much spacing should have here, how much spacing here. But when you're building this template, how much spacing this sidebar and my this organism should have is a responsibility of your template or, 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 or template or your page. So have this clear segregation because for example, I'll give you a very, very basic example here. Let's say your organism defined that I should uh, have a margin of eight pixels across, okay? So you added that style into your organism, but later on you want to consume the same organism at some other page, which should have a 16 pixels of styles or 16 pixels uh, of margin across. Your organism is not gonna work in that case, correct? Your styles broke because you did not keep the right thing at the right place. So make sure all these organisms defines what is into it and let the, let the, let the, later building blocks define it. Like how should it look like in within the whole template of a page? Was it clear or was I able to answer your question? Yeah, 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 Vishal. Thank you. Hello. Vishal, uh, uh, I just have one more question. Uh, so how do you suggest to publish these components? Like for example, publishing all the atoms in a single package or uh, individual atom in a single package? What do you suggest in both these approach? It's again, a very good question. Thanks for asking. 
uh, depends. <laughs> uh, that's a very basic example. Of. So, uh, if if you know, uh, if anyone has used Lodash library, uh, uh, you will see that by default you can always say import uh, debounce from Lodash, correct? Or Lodash has also exposed very specific utilities also there. So it can say that import depounds from lodash dot depounds. Correct? So how does this these two things differ? When you build this, uh, the whole lodash as a library is building with you. You have tree shaking, you have everything. But in, in general, when you are building this, the whole artifact, your lodash will come into picture, but unused will be removed from tree shaking. But when you when you use this, only lodash debounce code is coming into it. So you don't even worry about tree shaking here. So similarly, uh, I would say when you are starting up, if you have time, definitely you can say that create different uh, libraries uh, or different uh, expose mechanism uh, for each component. And it's very easy to build it. Instead of saying button.tsx, you can just say index.tsx or have a index.ts file which expose export button. Once that part is done, you can you can again simply import say button or default button from my UI library slash button. So this will just expose your button. Or if you don't want to spend this much of time, you can easily say have a root level index.ts which actually exposes all the components. And you can easily say that, okay, render a button from my UI library. This will save some, some space, uh, like whatever you are, some M or KBs from your the whole artifact. This will make sure the whole UI library uh, comes into your artifact. But you can always build this. It's very, very easy to build this. We had tried that in our project and it works very nicely. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I think we are running out of time, so I'll quickly move on. Uh, so we saw a demo. This is just a very basic slide of what are the already available proper, popular design systems. So we all know material design. Material design itself gives you a very good component library which can, you can directly consume. Uh, it also gives you a mechanism to override the default theme. Or I have also seen projects where they want to use the material design system and want to tweak a bit also. For example, it already has some atoms available. So you want to use the material design atoms and build your own molecules or build your own organisms also. And so on. I think most of the big enterprises have been started following this practice to build their own design systems. Yeah. So clearly moving towards the micro front end world, we thought like this, this is a something uh, a hot topic in the market. So we will discuss about this in two, in two minutes. So different implementation ways of this library. We, we saw that we can build a separate library, uh, but uh, in, 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 if you go in some, in some past, we'll see that usually when we started the web applications, uh, we were having monoliths where we were creating a shared directory with some shared components. So your buttons will go into it. Your, your input boxes will go into it. But this is a single repo, uh, which, which has a shared components. Now, once, once the team started realizing that this is not extensible, uh, so they started extracting out the component library in a separate repo. And, and one of monolith, front-end monolith, started consuming it as an NPM module. And the last one, like since we have been moving to micro front end words, a single component library you have built, which can be consumed by different micro front end teams directly. Now, imagine that yes, if you are still into this world and you have you want to build MFEs, each MFE will do will end up duplicating the same code base again and again. And it is very easy to easily to easy to break the whole design language there because 
one team can build your components in a sec in a different way and another team will build it in a separate way this this is mfp2 and 3 it's a type of it so just talking about the same thing uh, what's the advantages over monolith versus micro front end setup in in case of design systems code maintainability of course uh, if you are building it in a monolith it becomes a overhead uh, and in micro front end since you are segregated the whole design library into a separate repo as we just saw the examples of tests uh, typescript it becomes very very maintainable code uh, if you are segregating those two coupling and cohesion uh, uh, again if you are keeping your components into your uh, within with your business component business logic itself it is very easy to clutter that for example you might end up writing a button which will making an api call it in, in the button component itself it that is not at all extensible correct maybe the same button you want to use somewhere else which wants to make another different api call you cannot cannot make that happen with that but in mfe world keeping a design system design library separately you are you are you are, you are achieving a, a, a sim, single responsibility over there uh, and and making sure you follow a particular theme also as a part of that and last but not least configurability uh, you can of course we just saw that uh, in in uh, in a separate library uh, we can easily pass a different theme plug and play with that also but that is not possible if you are building the whole comp shared components in a monolith only any any questions uh, cool uh, i i'll move on uh, I, last things i think last part of this uh, geek night will be covered by ankit again so ankit over to you again thanks vishal yeah now we'll talk about a great idea uh, known as design guilds uh, is my screen visible yeah all right yeah so uh, if you see the i find this image quite explaining the fact that we uh, actually have implemented in thoughtworks and uh, is quite popular in industry as of now so this is the idea of design guild what is uh, this buzzword so it's a regular check in that uh, has to happen between the design team the developers and your business representatives you can say the pos pms you name it so we see it's it's a normal meeting why do we need it I means why a special buzzword for it even so see when we have uh, our teams separated in geography and we have like a common product oriented team but it has separate goals to achieve we get a hit on design let's say in our uh, agile manner that we have to uh, maybe deliver some product in a deadline so what suffers its design we have seen it and we need to avoid it so for this reason we need a common group where we validate that what we are delivering has same design that was uh, presented to our stakeholders while we uh, delivered the you can say the wireframes or while we had the user testing and another reason to have the design guilds are so more risk, risks we can highlight in the beginning we can uh, uh, determine whether the designs are achievable so most of the times what happens design team give us the designs we uh, don't evaluate it so often and when the development team sees it they say no this is not feasible we cannot achieve pagination api cost is too too high so and, and they simply skip it yeah and the design team takes the hit again so, goes for so many conversations that you might recall that uh, we developers might have to do with designers and yeah to, to to reduce that risk we can arrange such a meeting where we highlight that first same to help you achieve a consistent design across your teams you don't have to imagine like uh, uh, only the geography team setup but in general where you are depending upon some other team or some other team is consuming some data from you same you have if you want to achieve the consistent design there this uh, design guild idea might come handy then the visual inter interaction consistency so of course it's not only about how it visually looks it's also about how when you interact it let's say uh, is the pull up uh, is happening as usual or not whether you are adhering to the ios and android standards yeah the popovers the tooltips etc then uh, 
also to evaluate the different possibilities. So you can uh, also recommend the designers what all uh, new things that you have learned as a development buzz. You can also get them on board. And meanwhile, while you are pairing with them on a sketch for designs, they can also help you in validating whether you have built a perfect component. So we actually tried this in our team and it's a really successful model. So our designers actually collaborated with us in creating the component libraries. Yeah. And lastly, so uh, be more precise what value is being delivered. So this is where the business reps would come in. So they would actually validate whether the this interaction design or this design would actually create some value for them or not. Is it uh, time to market or whether we'll generate any uh, revenue out of it? That's what they would evaluate from this user testing or user research of the design. And not the, uh, not the least one, so the, it would create a smooth experience for everyone. Yeah, if you have, uh, you can say consistency and symmetry always play out, always soothing to our eyes. So yes, it will create a smooth experience if we uh, have consistency in our design. Any questions on what are design guilds and or why they are important? I'll add one more thing <laughs> on top of that. Like uh, we discussed about micro front end setup, correct? Uh, so in micro front end setup, you have multiple teams uh, and it is very possible that uh, in such a big team, you will have multi vendor setup also. So design guilds comes very, very handy in that so that your different teams from different organizations actually follows the same same design library, same design components. So we have seen that in our project that's not being followed. We have seen the issues related to that also. Uh, and the only, I think one of the solution is following the design uh, 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 practice. Yeah. So to answer Ram's question, uh, it's, it's a mix of pre and post. So mostly pre, I would say. So you would evaluate it before your iterations. And let, let's say a tech representative would assess whether it is feasible or not. Your PO would assess whether the it would uh, generate some revenue or not, and so on. Whether, whether it would make sense in a journey or not. And your designers would give you, of course, the wireframes and they, they will, uh, you can guide them that what's missing or what better we can do. Yeah. Doing it post, it will be retro. You can do it uh, later on to just to see whether the design actually played out um, using any off the shelf tool, like uh, maybe uh, uh, some reviewing tool, let's say Aptentive, where you, sh where you say, uh, are the users loving this app or not? But yeah, the pre model will be more helpful to, to be proactive in this approach. All right. And, and just to add to it, I would say uh, uh, in, in this kind of a meeting, you can also define what should actually be a part of your component library. Uh, it's not uh, like, for example, you should not add anything which is functional to your system, uh, any business logic into the system. What So in such meeting, you can define those also, which is a reusable thing. If this is not reusable, that should not be a part of your component. So these kind of decisions also come from here. Yeah, thanks, Vishal. All right, um, moving on to the pitfalls. Yeah, yeah. Is this familiar guy for everyone? Yes. Familiar team. Who who is that? Yes, Nikitesh. Ah, uh, this is Pokemon. Yeah, Ash catch him. Oh, Ash catch him. Yeah. So yeah, if, if you remember in in that particular cartoon, they always uh, fall into the pitfalls and then they curse them. That why do we always fall into the pitfalls? And yes, that shouldn't happen to us. So while we are designing uh, these design systems or implementing, developing them, we should uh, be cautious about the pitfalls. So we are sharing our experiences here that uh, we have also like, you, you need to fail fast and then learn and do not repeat those mistakes again. So we will just uh, uh, talk about some pitfalls that usually happen when you are developing your design system. First is that you stop at design. Most of the time, if you recall, you uh, take design team inputs, but they stop at design. You do not implement them at all because you say it's not feasible. 
yeah you make adjustments and you say uh, i can only achieve in, uh, in in a two pointer story or in a two days i can only achieve this much portion i cannot achieve the consistent design let's create a new story and that story is never prioritized yeah that shouldn't happen then betting on a single technology so it can be a little tricky although uh, in the new world like web component based we are now combining we are out of like react angular view however if you choose a particular niche technology their design is not that much extensible that might come with a cost yeah then moving on to limited component building expertise so if you want to build the components they should be like really re reusable it shouldn't happen that uh, everything that you are expecting in props but they are not actually configurable you are just using them as static or you are not config configuring them at all or the main props you are missing out so your components they should be highly reusable and finally we we are not here to build a html css only library which was quite popular i think 10 years ago when we had jquery javascript out of the picture yeah so it should have some logic built into it that will only come when you have a framework into play or when you start at a component design yeah any any questions on pitfalls anyone would like to add their experience um yeah prakash your question is by logic um sorry i'm not familiar with this word intractability oh, okay intractability yes so uh, in general your component library like vishal said we should publish this as well like it, it should be available to your uh, future products where you want to see what i have already built yeah so yes by logic when you say intractability yes uh, like as you mentioned that a button should be clickable but that should be a part of your life a button what should happen on that click should not be a part of your life yeah um you have a question maria yeah uh, yeah, hey, thanks for the amazing content. I wasn't able to join at the beginning, but um, so I might have missed if you <laughs> touch upon this point, but I wanted to ask if uh, first uh, the code example I saw uh, may I guess is React, and if you have experience uh, trying to bring solutions of component libraries to or design systems to teams that use different technologies, like they use React View, can use Angular. Um, and yeah, just just wondering if you have encountered that. Uh, so we didn't cover that part like technology wise. So in essential, if you want to build agnostic library, then it, uh, if one example could be it can leverage web components, which have been like very uh, popular uh, in past uh, few years, or there are more off the shelf products coming. If I'm not wrong, Stencil is one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So your component library, it can use that as a base, but if you start using it as the node modules, like your node module is react based and you want to use it in a library, which is angular based. Yes. There you will get some compilation uh, problems mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Unless you uh, complete it at a JavaScript level where you are completely platform agnostic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I have those. We're trying to solve that challenge and I'm looking for also, um, people that have been there because I think it's so new that many of the things we're facing are just very hard to find people that uh, uh, that have gone through that path before. Uh, we're using web components with Stencil. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope in the future we can exchange some ideas uh, about the work we have done before. Uh, but yeah, thank you for the recommendations. Yeah, sure, Maria. Uh, Vishal, would you like to add as well? Uh, so in, like, in addition to stencil JS, there is one more uh, framework called Litte Elements uh, that is very, very uh, small uh, build uh, that, that it actually gives you out of it. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed, uh, uh, people uh, saying that uh, web components actually does not work pretty well in React apps because of their shadow DOM behavior of, of web components and all. But I've also seen people saying that it works with some tweaks. 
so maybe something to work around or one one other way i can see is like if 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 a project has if a micro front end first you will be building micro front end is different technologies correct so if if we are building the component library in one technology in an mfs into different technologies another way around is like uh, solve the components on the fly with with the actual framework build also it's not the best solution i would say but it is it's, it's very much possible it makes sense thank you yeah i really like that the collaboration idea uh, to, you, you're part of thoughtworks maria uh, yes um uh, i got the invite from somebody in india i'm in germany uh, but they're in my team in auto and uh, they thought about sharing because we're working on something very similar so yeah i definitely reach out yeah sure Let, let's connect yeah, I, i think we can find a common ground to discuss uh, this in great deal yeah. thank you all right uh, i think this is the time for another q and a if anyone has any questions please shoot and yeah so uh, the references and courtesy to all the blogs that we followed and yeah now this uh, repo which vishal shared is it's also available so uh, watch out for the meet up um, there will post the, the slides and the other content once it is approved from uh, the marketing team yeah all right any further questions from anyone this is the time all right in case no questions please uh, yeah um tesh yes yes it is about the like as a design guild like as we do have like as the uh, grooming sessions like as in, in every sprint so is it the thing like as it is little, little similar like as where all person come in the manager the um the uh, business analyst and all that is we groom what is the uh, like as actually we need to deliver so is it is it somewhat same or it is an a bit different from this yeah yeah so in my opinion uh, it's little different so this is a avenue where you are centric to design and not centric to delivery yeah delivery is just a part of that you have to deliver that design in development as well mm. you have to uh, represent each persona here however in the grooming session i uh, i say that the designers they are just uh, like they don't have much say in my opinion the refiner or grooming sessions that i have attend mm -hmm. so everyone should have equal say and then they would uh, uh, validate whether the design is okay or what are the suggestions or how we can uh, shape it up so that it is implementable and deliverable okay so it is in between uh, like as uh, the client's agreement like as the, the what client wants and then before making any design uh, like as this is a like as we can have that type of meeting in between right once you have the initial designs available that would be more okay. fruitful uh, like is uh, after wireframe then first round of design and then we can have this type of meeting you say correct and it should be a regular one means uh, you can say every bi weekly once your stories uh, before development for hmm. every iteration you can have this design guild maybe a fortnightly catch up okay okay thanks all right um any more questions from anyone still one minute left in schedule time uh yeah please uh, feel free to uh, put on feedback that would help us to improve and to uh, deliver uh, the content that you wish for in future geek nights as well please put on ideas for the topics that you are interested in and yeah we'll try to cover that in the, in the further geek nights yeah we have shared the link in chat uh, you can add there 